In front of reporters, Representative Yoho called me, and I quote, a fucking bitch. It's the Such Social a Security nasty Trust Fund. That's a woman for you. I ask her to get my shirts whiter. Intersectionality. Welcome to the Witch Podcast, our weekly journey through all the ways women have been tricked, robbed of power, outcast, convinced of our inferiority, manipulated into belittling each other, had our autonomy usurped, and how we've otherwise been saddled with immense internal misogyny over the last 12,000 years. I am your coven sister and ball of latent rage host, Lauren Eckert. And today we are joined by my trying to be by icon and littlest brother, Reed Eckert, to talk about the witch hunts of the early modern period in Europe. Reed, welcome. Tell us about yourself. Hello. First of all, I would like to say I don't think there's trying to be a bicon icon anything about it i think i'm a bicon um second of all thank you for having me <laughs> <laughs> um yeah a little bit about me before we get into it and like why i'm here one i mean to start with i'm a intersectional feminist and queer activist i am a yeah bisexual i identify as bisexual myself um as well as i am a English major and a uh, medieval uh, medievalist, studying medievalist. Not a not a not like a, a degree in medievalist, but I'm studying medieval studies and classical studies, uh, as well as English literature. Yeah, I I think that's pretty much everything. Rad. All right, shall we get on to debunking some of the myths of misogyny and revealing some too often obscured history? Yeah, let's do it. All right. Before we dive in, let's establish a couple of things. Um, so much of history is revisionist and white or European centric. Well, at the time period we're going to talk to today, which is about the 1400s to mid 1700s in Europe, the concept of whiteness wasn't necessarily constructed yet. Uh, a focus on Europe often supports white supremacist assumptions about the world, whitewashing history. And through the long arc of this podcast, we will definitely be moving far beyond Europe and white people's history. But for this episode and the several episodes to come in which we talk about the early modern period witch trials in Europe, we focus on the witch hunts in Europe as they are the epicenter and in many ways the progenitor of large scale and sweeping attitudes and misogynistic persecution of or hysteria about air quotes witches. And a lot of the notions and the hysteria that we see arise in this time period, I think arguable, arguably will define patriarchal persecution and colonization on non-white people for ages to come. And the witch trials we'll, we'll talk about today still have profound impacts both in daily life of human, men and women, and non-binary folks, but also witch hunts are still occurring modernly in places like Tanzania, Papua New Guinea, um, and, and witch hunts by different names are occurring all around the world in the form of femicide. So my, my second point uh, related to this idea that much of history is white centric and European dominated is that it blows my mind in researching this. Um, given that Eurocentric history is what I mostly learned growing up in school in Northwestern Iowa, it is buck wild that my textbooks did not cover this consequential period of history that we're going to talk about today that shapes so much of pre industrial, industrial, and post-industrial world. Um, so yeah, most of what I've learned about this period of time I've learned in the past couple of weeks, though, as you've explained, Reed, that I am a scientist and these topics are probably relatively common knowledge for folks with post-secondary education in English or feminist theory, etc. Finally, my third primer and 
it is a frequent disclaimer on this podcast. I am not an expert in women's studies, in feminist theory. Um, I'm not an expert in European history or any history. The only claim I have to talk about the stuff we'll discuss today is that I have an experience as a woman human trying to overcome nearly three decades of internalized misogyny. And so the witch trials we're going to discuss today are nuanced, they're complex, and I lean heavily on historians, feminist scholars, sociologists, economists, you, Reed, um, and others to gain insight into this complicated and super disturbing bit of human history. Yeah, and I feel like I need not say, um, I don't even have a bachelor's degree, comma. Why did I just try to text to speech that? I've You're been close, living alone for so long. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't even have a bachelor's degree yet. So everything I um, I bring to the table, I bring from personal experience of trying my best to be a, a positive feminist, um, as well as a person who tries to study this stuff and become familiar with it. God, we're so humble and cool. <laughs> so humble. And just like really incredible. Look at us go. Um, okay. So with this precursor out of the way and me and Reed making very clear that we are just bullshitting about this, essentially, we are not experts on this topic. Why talk about historical witch hunts at all? Contemporary attacks on women in power and those who currently lack power due to systemic forces of sexism, racism, colonization, are still occurring in the form of sexism, harassment, assault, full-on witch trials, and femicide. The about 300-year period of European history and the several hundred years before which led up to it, which we will discuss in this three-part podcast series, arguably shapes a lot of historical, colonial, and contemporary thought around women and has created implicit and explicit societal norms that support power dynamics, massive schools of thought, small-scale radical movements, and systems that profoundly impact us all today. And to quote Silvia Federici, an Italian and American scholar, teacher, and activist, a radical feminist Marxist, Witch hunting in all its different forms is also a powerful means to destroy communal relations, injecting the suspicion that underneath the neighbor, the friend, the lover hides another person lusting for power, sex, wealth, or simply wanting to commit evil deeds. Federici warns, it is only by keeping the memory of the witch hunts alive that we can prevent it from being turned against us. So let's hop right in. Let's set the stage. Let's set the stage for what would become one of the darkest periods of European history. I don't know. I don't know if I feel good about saying that. Like European history, <sighs> a dark period in European history, like a, a, a precursor to a lot of worse things to come, but a, a nasty uh, period of European history. So Reed, I, I want us to get started in the 1300s, Europe. Um, there, there aren't a lot of witch trials occurring at this time. They're quite rare, but I want to start here because I really want to set the witch trials that we'll discuss in the broader sort of social, political, and economic context of the 1300s leading into the 1400s Europe. And so at this time period, we find ourselves in feudal Europe and the history I'll, I'll discuss during this period of time, the 1300s to the 1400s. So a, a lot of these records kept during this time period, which are excellent for attempting to build an understanding of social and political life at this time in history, were in fact written by powerful, educated, typically wealthy, ruling class white men, many of which um, were serving the Catholic Church in recording records. Recording records is nothing. In creating records. So we already start like beyond potentially um, revisionist interpretations. We start hearing at history through primary material that is also biased in nature. With that said, 
the 1300s was a fucking wild century. Are you like, are you aware of what a crazy time it was to be a human in the 1300s? Not that you would live the whole century. I mean, you'd probably live <laughs> 28 years, but yeah, uh, I mean, I know a little bit. Um, yeah, it, it was really just a kind of anything. If you weren't like a rich white dude, life was really hard is basically what I know about the 1300s. Um, I mean, probably even for rich white dudes, like we didn't have germ theory back then. So you got a disease and it, it was kind of it. And we'll get into that later because that's a lot of what I think I interpret as a driving factor in, in the witch trials to come. But it was also like beyond just that life sucked for everyone, but particularly everyone who wasn't a wealthy landholding white male. And even then, man, if you were a wealthy white dude who liked dudes, eh, probably not. Well, I don't know if you were rich enough, might have been fine. But there were there were a lot of things going on in the early modern period, or in the 1300s that would sort of define the early modern period to come. So at this time period, we have the formation of the Ottoman Empire and its expansion into the Balkans. So this massive empire expands Southeast Europe, Western Asia, Northern Africa between the 14th and 20th centuries. And in, in the 1300s, we also see the emergence of the beginning of the Italian Renaissance. So the social political climate is beginning to change from the, the dark ages, medieval ages, where it, hey, his, you know about history. Yeah, I would call it the medieval time period is starting to change with the um, with the birth of the uh, printing press, Gutenberg's printing press, the, the European printing press. There was actually one in Korea. Yeah. Um, and that's kind of what signifies the official end of the, of the medieval period and like fully embraces gotcha. the Renaissance okay. is, is that. Yeah. And I found a few scholars who point out and, and, I think do so. I think it matters what they point out about the term the Renaissance. There's this sort of cultural understanding now that the Renaissance was a period of higher knowledge, like a societal rebirth into a better way of being human. Science uh, and the arts were highly focused on. But periodization, so like the creation of chunks of time into the medieval and early modern periods or into the, the Renaissance, is really arbitrary and necessarily misses capturing sort of the messy reality of humans, of history, and of the forces that like result in the categorization of these turning points. So just something to, to consider that like the 1300s is seeing the rise of the Italian Renaissance. That does not mean that we suddenly have a pivot point in the 1300s that will herald us into an enlightened world. So at this time in the Arab world, there were significant political and technological advancements occurring. We're also seeing a, a global, but in particularly a European transition climactically. So we were moving from what is categorized as a medieval warm period to the Little Ice Age. And during this time, the Catholic Church was certainly pervasive in, in people's lives, but it was largely decentralized. So while it was unchallenged as a large-scale religion, and they had begun in the 1300s labeling dissenters of the faith as heretics, it's not like the massive force we often imagine or, or even see now in the world in terms of social, economic, and political organization. And in fact, the Roman Church in this time period, the Roman Catholic Church, was going through its own share of upheaval. Through a million things I'm not going to get into because we could do an entire podcast series on them. At this time period, kings, various kings in Europe were attempting to take control of local clergy. Um, the Avignon Papacy transfers the seat of popes from Italy to France. And then eventually we get to a point in 1378 called the Great Schism of the West, which I do remember learning about in uh, Catholic school social science books. Basically, they're squabbling between Catholics in power regarding where the seat of the church should be. So, so the, the Roman Catholic Church is having its own sort of early life crisis at this time period. 
Um, let's see other important things that were happening. So around 1315, with this emergence of the Little Ice Age, there was also the emergence of famines across Europe. So the Great Famine, as it's so called, killed millions in Europe from the time period of 1315 to 1317. The Hundred Years' War, a scuffle between the rulers of the Kingdom of England and France for the seat of Western Europe, begins in 1337, so about the middle of the 1300s, and the battle goes on for nearly a little over 100 years and severely weakens both monarch, both English and French monarchies. And so amidst all this turmoil, we have climactic change that is killing millions of people who are starving. We have the Catholic Church sort of not well centralized um, within its own internal warfares. And we have England and France at war. In 1347, you know, you know a little thing, little thing that happens in 1347 in Europe that kind of changes life for everyone. No one tell me about it. I mean, I'll give you a hint. Like, we would probably have a lot of sympathy for this now. The, the uh, terror that might be incited by something that would impact yeah it's weird it's hanging right on the tip of my tongue i just can't it feels so familiar like almost like i've lived it um so weird um oh is it the plague is it the great plague yeah yeah it's a it's a great plague it's the black death um yeah so we here in 2020 in uh, quarantine station now let's be clear are doing way better at what well, mm, are doing mostly better about understanding the origination and how to avoid the plague <laughs> so the the black death begins in 1347 or like severely impacts europe beginning in 1347 and i always only learned about the black death through the veil of how it impacted white people in europe but of course like the origination of the bubonic plague is unknown in terms of geographical location but we do know that it devastated asia and the middle east before it impacted europe so it killed 90 percent of the hebei hopefully i'm saying that right sorry i'm almost certainly not province and tens of millions of people in China. Persia lost 30% of its population. And Middle East, you know, is brutally impacted by this disease. But the bubonic plague follows sort of the Silk Road trade routes. And in this time period in Europe, it kills 25 million people, which at the time was a third of the population. So, like, COVID-19 sucks so hard, and it's scary all the time. But we also have modern medicine have germ theory, and for the most part, understand its transmission pathways. Can you imagine if one in three people around you was dropping horrifically dead without germ theory? Like, in like bad hygiene, very bad hygiene in this time period, right? And so it was not, the 1300s were not a cool and good time beyond just that, like, a, a life was not great in general, and you mostly lived to 32. So we're in Europe. We're in the 1300s. Everything's bad. One in three people are dying. And in 1348, so again, remember Black Death, the historical time period we have for the Black Death, the, the first round of the bubonic plague is 1347 to 1351. And then in 1348, a 6.9 magnitude earthquake in northern Italy is felt throughout Europe. And so... Again, get yourself in the headspace. Everyone's dying. It's just like really bad. There were a lot of famines that your parents or grandparents went through. And then everyone's dropping dead around you. And then there was an earthquake in Northern Italy, bad enough that it was felt throughout all of Europe. Again, we think 2020 is bad and it is like I 2020, but 1348 was a bad one. It was a bad one. Yeah, and, and it's also like, so possible that somebody lived through the Black Plague, probably the greatest, like, most dangerous and one of the most inf dangerous infectious diseases to have ever been on the Earth, only to make, to live to see a terrible 6.2 magnitude earthquake. Like, bitch, what do you even do? Well, no, this is like, they definitely did. Because, like, 1347, Black Death's on the ground in Europe. 1348, one year late, later, Big scary ground shaking. 
Like, the, do you just think that God's cheek. mad at you at that point? Like, what is, what are you thinking at that point? Yes, Raven. You do indeed. You do indeed think God is mad at you at that point. You don't know what the fuck earthquakes is. You don't know about tectonic plates. The earth is shaking and everyone's dying. And so, after the earthquake, people start to kind of freak out. Like, combined with the Black Death, people are like, okay, the Bible did say, like, an apocalypse is going to come. I think it's here. I Like, a lot of contempor- educated contemporary minds were fueling this idea. And I don't necessarily blame them. Again, probably I have called this year an apocalypse any number of times. Um, so... It, like it's, it's a did it's they a think they were getting response. raptured or did they just think it was like the I, apocalypse you know biblical apocalypse i i don't know how they were interpreting it then many people interpret biblical apocalypse in a bunch of different ways now they just thought yeah everyone was gonna the earth was gonna be gone so like probably some people would get raptured but like the earth was ending they were all gonna die everyone was gonna die it was very bad um yeah so so that happens stuff is really rough everyone thinks god is killing the the earth planet and so th- so we're we're moving to close out sort of our conversation on the great events that happened in 1300s that that make this period of time make even the slightest bit of sense and so what I'll, what I'll close out on is that around the 1380 so about 30 years after the really bad year with the Black Plague and the earthquake, peasants begin to revolt in England. And their peasants revolt sort of throughout Europe, beginning around this time period, I say, without much qualification for it, but but to follow in, in greater waves. And scholars point to high taxes at this time period resulting from the Hundred Years' War and its consequences and how expensive it is to fight a war for 100 years. Instability in local leadership in London, the socioeconomic realities created by the Black Death also meant that there were less peasants so they could demand more for their work. And so in in this early revolt, rebels sought reduction in taxes, end to the system of serfdom, and removal of several political officials. And so this just gives some insight into sort of like alongside the monarchy upheavals, alongside the church's internal conflict, alongside all the, because of probably all of the shit that was going down in the century, peasants and lower classes are beginning to revolt in the late 1300s. Uh, What also happens in the late 1300s is that Jewish people begin to be massacred in Spain and Portugal. And there are also a few isolated trials of witches in Europe in this time period. And the, the few papers that I read on these periods of massacres is that everyone was freaking the fuck out. And as we often do in history in varying ways and modernity, the general public starts looking for internal scapegoats to blame for the very bad state of things in the late 1300s. So that's a perhaps all too long explanation of where we are in the 1300s leading our way into the 1400s. It's been a rough <laughs> trail. That's pretty like, that's pretty bad stuff. Yeah, that's that pretty bad doesn't shit. sound like... It sounds like a really bad little patch in history. Like the, I imagine that the people who are like the kids of the the parents who went through this were also in a bad way because you know trauma. Um, and so it, it's something that's like gonna stick yeah. around too. Epigenetics, especially too in stuff there. like um, anti-Semitic anti-Semitism mm-hmm. or misogyny mm-hmm. has a way of warming its way through these. Uh, through these family traditions, I want to say, or, or cultural zeitgeist, it has a way to stick around. But Reed, well, but Reed, we're cured. We were cu- we're cured. Right, of, there's no of all those. There's downs, no anti-Semitism or misogyny. Oh my there's god, no, there's no through line. No, there's no, no. there's no through line. Absolutely, there's no. It's good. It died with our grandparents. That was really dark because our grandparents are actually dead. Our grandparents are actually dead. I'm so sorry. I know I <laughs> fucked that up. I should have said great grandparents. So we're like, our grandparents were also like probably oh, anti-Semitic and misogynist. They were definitely certainly one hundred percent. Nana wasn't. 
Nana was neither no. of those things. I'm so sorry, Nana. No, I'm sorry. I mm. Grandma, Grandma probably wasn't anti-Semitic. She was racist. No, I don't I know. Do. I don't know. Um, anyways. I don't like this. Let's move I don't, on. Let's I hate the energy we've this. created in the studio this. today. I also um, do, yeah. So we're moving our way okay. into the 14th century with a lot of, like, tension building. Um, both, you know, mm, political yeah, class yeah. tension, a little bit of um, racism and misogyny and all of that good stuff that... Yes. Really a lot. So we're moving lot. into the 14th yeah. century, or the 1400s, with a lot of tension. A lot of... Yeah. Yeah, t- shit's, shit's bad, everyone's mad at each other, and no one knows why people get diseases, or that earthquakes happen because the earth is moving and not God. So, and, and like, let's think about day-to-day life for people in this time period, too, right? Because it, it's, we've got, sort of gotten to that with being like, oh, man, I, like, I've also lived through a plague. It's bad. But the demographics of how people live look a lot differently in the 1300s in Europe, as you may imagine, than they do now. So about 90% of Europeans lived rurally. So crop failure and disease were constant threats in the light of, of the life of these people. Their diet was largely barley and rye. So people ate a lot of bread and drank a lot of beer, which sounds pretty on point. Like probably lower quality, more processed grains now. But I connect with um, my certainly European ancestors I do on love that bread one. and beer. Yeah, no, it's it's in our blood. We are white white people from so the Europe white. the Europe tradition. We probably have some like cool internalized trauma epigenetic linked to this time period for things got to be there you know we're we're, we're, you know read we're out here we're deconstructing whiteness by reclaiming our awesome cool heritage of eating only bread and beer and burning women at the stake here we are (laughs) you know exploring our culture fucking doing our good good (laughs) cool and good work um yeah yeah Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So work at this time was largely organized in and regulated by guilds or town councils. And both men and women were involved in in guilds. We'll get into that a little bit more later. Small nuclear families existed at this time, but with quite strong kinship ties. So we enter this time period with um, sort of soft land enclosures, like poorly regulated Um. Like personal land ownership is is not conceptualized then as it is now, and there's a lot of like deeply intertwined rural communities in feudal Europe. So a lot of reliance between households. The household was more flexible than it is now. It it was very open to the broader community. Yeah. So so as Sharon T. Stracia in Re- in her Renaissance Studies 2014 paper, Renaissance is how you say that word called the concept of the household conceived as, quote, an open, flexible space with permeable boundaries. So land is typically communally defined at this time, or land ownership is held by a a greater lord. Um, And there were lots of structures in place for shared medical care, shared child care, and generally like an implied safety net for the most impoverished in many communities. Not so much out of... um, a generous act of socialism, but rather because of the structure of these communities. And for many people at this time period, church uh, was the center of common life. But there's a lot of evidence at this time that while Catholicism had sort of expanded its roots all across Europe, that that Catholicism was heavily interspersed with many pagan rituals. Um, So the means of, of Catholicism hadn't truly infiltrated much of individual and community beliefs, so though the church was a place of... Yeah, so I think I can actually speak to this a little bit. Um, so the idea of Catholicism and the church rowing their way into kind of, you know, rural uh, European feudal life at this time um, comes from the idea of the Reformation, which was, I think, a move by Pope Gregory, um, he would have his his you know his priests his his bishops his his cardinals go out to these rural places and find places where they 
worship either local deities or heroes or gods or spirits. And at that, he would say, hey, go to these shrines and say, because they would have strong ties with the, the feudal landowners of this time, the lords, the floridas. Um, and they would say, hey, what you're doing right now is church. And this isn't Bridget, this isn't Bridget, the local hero who, who the local goddess, this is St. Bridget, a hero of the what? Catholic Church. That's um, wild. And they were allowed to do that because they had such a strong connection to the lords. Um, and so they would have people receive the Eucharist, um, receive communion, and... Jesus' body... They cannibalize zombie Jesus. Yes, they would cannibalize zombie zombie Jesus Jesus at these local holy sites. Okay. Um, And so that's how you end up with – we can see it around in our modern culture. Um, What's the church? uh, St. Anthony, St. Anthony, come around, something's lost and can't be found. And can't be found. Yeah, dude. Dear St. Anthony, please come around. Yeah, so that's some holdover from a local – that's the influence of local um, saints. Uh, and you can see this permeate culture until it becomes more, you know, of a whole picture of Catholicism. Mm. Um, so, so you have, that's kind of how this idea of, that's how they integrated paganism in with Catholicism and then changed this religious epicenter, which would be the, uh, it would be the what brought communities together into you know all these disparate you know pagan beliefs into the church, and then the church becomes the center of life because so was their religious worship before this. And it is really really fascinating. I was also just thinking how wild it is that like we're we're a while into recording, um, and I haven't gotten like incredibly filled with rage yet, and I feel like I've been um, discontented, but. Yeah, the really angry and stuff hasn't really happened yet. The Catholic Church is like at at worst sneaky at this time period, but we're getting to some of the well, earlier stuff. Sneaky, they get more sneaky. Well, I would say they They're get pretty less sneaky, sneaky at this point I'd too. Say they get because less this is sneaky. also they get real bold. Lot. This is also the same uh, period that they they start selling indulgences. Yeah, that is now. You're right. That I'm is correct. pretty fucking sneaky. Like, hey. Okay, this is we're really going off on a tangent. You just it, this is because I was like, oh, I haven't been mad yet, and you were like, Haha, you want to talk about when the Catholic Church is like, <laughs> you, you want to be mad to at white history? I got you <laughs> to go to be forgiven for your sins. Here's an indulgence, and if you buy enough, you can just sin, and they'll all be forgiven because God is money, and money is God. And I just did, I just did the invention of capitalism, but I, that's something I didn't bring up earlier because of. There's this, like, I think French monarchy leader who wanted to, all of the clergy, the Catholic clergy, to be under his power. And so they split. The, the Catholic Church, again, really decentralized, attempts to become this sort of, like, independent organization that we know it as today. But they had no money. And so they start commodifying every single service they provide to people. One of those services being... You're going to burn in hell if God doesn't forgive you. And if you want to be forgiven for your bad sins, which is everything, including masturbation, for sure. If you've ever masturbated or thought lustfully about someone, you are going to hell for a little bit. But if you don't want to stay in hell the whole time, please buy this thing I'm selling you and then you can go to heaven. Anyway. Okay, cool. I'm mad now. Well, I think it's also important that we talk about that because that's super, super tightly integrated with a little bit of like a political Marxist reading of the witch burnings. Um, This idea of a like almost a primitive resource grab. You can almost call the the Catholic Church selling indulgences kind of a a weirdly primitive resource grab on the idea of uh, being saved of an afterlife. They like primitively grabbed the resource of the afterlife once again i'm not a philosopher or an economicist economics person economist yeah so my point being proved that's kind of how i would interpret yeah, I, this we will spend an entire episode just talking about 
what the hell happened, why people lost their mind and killed a bunch of women, um, which is a question for all of the last 12,000 years, unfortunately. But we will get into it. Like, this is, we want to set the stage for what the world looked like before the trial started. And then we talk about the trials and then we'll get into like, why, 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 why this, why now, what led to this? So we'll get into the idea of sort of like primitive, um, resource extraction for the purposes of capitalism and all of that. But before we do, let's talk about women's life in this time period, the late 1300s, early 1400s. So in this period of time, uh, yeah, no, I mean like no impotent rage, always potent, but it's it's like, it's not great. It's not a good time for women, but it's going to get worse. So we're going to start at a high point for women, the women who will be involved in this story. So in this time period, Women, of course, still live within the confines of a clearly patriarchal and wildly misogynistic society. However, again, really, but like bold, underlined, relatively speaking, women of Europe of the 1300s had more rights than their women counterparts who would follow them in, in the late 1400s, 1500s to 1700s, probably beyond that. So at this time, women were valued domestic workers, though they had very little economic independence, which is like, I don't even really like the word valued there. Valued domestic workers like is a wild way to describe a human. But point being that women were seen as valuable for the work they could do in and outside of the house. And I just want to say important. Yeah, they were important. Um, I mean, they- no, uh, I think it's important. They were important for economic reasons. Like, this all sounds so gross to talk about humans like this. But what we'll see is a change for why and how women are valued during the witch trial period brought on by the witch trials themselves. So just hold hold space for women to have been seen as, like, valuable in and outside of the house at this time period. Um, so I was surprised to find in reading that at this time, marriage dynamics were actually, like, I don't know, surprisingly similar to modern North American marriage dynamics. So women and men alike married relatively late. Women married around 25 years old and men around 27. And the age difference between partners was typically small. Uh, and this this late age of marriage for women in particular may have been due to financial challenges women and families faced at this time for reasons we have discussed in detail. So women may have remained unmarried because the value of the woman as a domestic worker was high. So families <laughs> wanted to hold on to their women, children, so that they would contribute to their household because as is the case in many patriarch, as is the case in all, this is sort of like a, a primary definition of a patriarchal society. When a woman married a man, they would typically move to be with the man's family. In a, in a sort of ecology context, in an evolutionary context, that's how we define social kinship between males and females. It's sort of who moves to to leave the family or join the family. And so these families needed the additional worker in the household, needed the additional provider and didn't want their daughters going off and getting married because often they needed a dowry for their daughter. And beyond that, like they did, they wanted her as a, <laughs> as a domestic worker and she would likely leave to go to a new community or at least to a new household. Um, so that that's the hypothesis or one of the, the core hypotheses as to why women married late in this time period. And and the work that women were doing in this time period was work like Brewster or making, you know, home family recipes like like iron gall or oak gall ink, right? Like that's the type of stuff that women were doing domestically. Yeah, yeah. So women are of course like also doing work around the home as you would expect. But um especially in rural places, women are competent and important workers. 
again, a wild way to describe human beings. But so they could work, though, in, in feudal, rural or feudal environments. They typically required male guardians to work. Um, but they participated in cottage industries, like you said, like brewing, baking, or manufacturing textiles. And often, because it's not like today where there's like, you know, one massive industrial farm that feeds a large number of people, women were also working on large, like collaboratively with men when work got overwhelming. So when labor duties were larger because, say, there was reaping or plowing to be done, women would also engage in partnership with men. It, it's worth noting here, too, that like <laughs> misogyny is still rampant. Women are still needing like permission from men or accompaniment by men to work in some conditions. And also in urban environments, they are, they're less likely to be able to do things like produce goods such as textiles, leather goods, metalwork, running shops and inns. So that's primarily rural. The, the way social life is structured in urban environments at this time creates greater gender equity imbalances. <laughs> I really like, so, so in talking about women marrying late and sort of having even a small degree of independence at this time relative to what will come, spoilers, I found this excellent translation of a poem by Anna Bijans um, on the benefits of celibacy and late marriage. And I will read that to you now. How good to be a woman. How much better to be a man! Exclamation point. Maidens and wenches, remember the lesson you're about to hear. Don't hurtle yourself into marriage far too soon. The saying goes, where is your spouse? Where's your honor? But one who earns her board and clothes shouldn't scurry to suffer a man's rod. Ellipsis. The wedlock I do not dec decree, decry? Decry. Definitely decry. The wedlock I do not decry. Unyoked is best! Exclamation mark. Happy the woman without a man. Um, so that's kind of the vibes. That's the vibes from women in the 1400s. You shouldn't scurry to suffer a man's rod. And I would say that applies to today as well. <laughs> Men are trash. We know this. As a, as a queer man, I also wouldn't hurry to suffer a man's rod. Just kidding. Don't suffer his rod, dude. Like, happy the woman. <laughs> Oh no! Sorry, mom. <laughs> I would like to think that. <laughs> um, Sorry, mom. Okay, so there are like three, a couple. There are a couple of things on my mind. So as I'm thinking about this, this all kind of seems to echo one. There's, I'm kicking myself because I can't remember exactly what they're called. But at this time period and around this time period of the Renaissance, there are these behavioral guides being published that tell women how to behave in public, um, how to do the appropriate manner that they should carry themselves with and, and in a way that won't offend anybody or provoke a man's ire or lust, essentially. Oh my god, I'm so glad it's not like that anymore. I'm so glad no one ever tells me oh God, that never. it's my fault if I but provoke a man's hide those man's fucking ire. shoulders, bitch. So, so, essentially, and you'll never guess what these three things are. The first one is be chaste. The woman should never be the aggressor. Oh my God, like, so, like, if a woman wants to do sex, she's, like, not an ideal woman? You know, you know, this idea of women, the, like, idea of carrying somebody over the threshold of a house or into the doorway of a house after being married is supposed to be representative of women not being excited to go, like, have sex. Yeah, women hate sex, So they sex have to be dr physically carried over the threshold. Yeah, like, women... I know, don't... I mean, don't I know it. <sighs> I hated that so much. I'm oh. so sad right now. I have to take that out of the podcast. I'm so upset. <laughs> I thought you were supposed to be a bisexual icon. <laughs> So sad. <laughs> I have a tear in my eye. Um, oh, bro, it was fucking gross. I've never done a podcast episode with my brother. <laughs> um, that's intrinsically tied to like sexual <laughs> relations, and and anyways, anyways the third thing is um, be chaste, be silent, and be pliant. Um, I believe. 
It's pretty common. They're pretty widespread at the time. This is very Malleus Maleficarum vibes, though, you know? Like, if you're if you're not those three things, you're a witch. Yes. Yeah. Literally, yes. Yes. Um, the other thing at this time period, though, is there's a strange dichotomy that is because women aren't supposed to go out of public, that means men are gone often. And that means women run the household. Women are, are they're kind of like, they, we'll get there when women are like, you stay at home, you're a prisoner in this house. Like, you never leave, because if you leave, you're probably going to have to do witch shit. Which, like, yeah, maybe they were do, gonna do some witch shit. Because witch shit meant, like, literally looking at another human. You're a witch. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. Because at this time period, again, predominantly in rural environments, women are still managing the house for the most part just like today, they're also working. Like, they're also going out in public. They're, it's not great, but you're, like, you're making your textiles, you're brewing your beer. Like, men are trash, and they are bossing around women. And I am not saying these women had any amount of equality, but they're not quite, like, imprisoned in their own homes yet. So, kind of regardless, women kind of run the house in an interesting way. Um, and oftentimes specifically in upper class where we have, you know, people who are literate and could write and record and we have, you know, letters between these women. That's when we know that women were running the house. They were the ones managing the house's finances. They were the ones making the ink that people are writing these letters with. They're the ones coming up with the medicine to keep people from getting sick. They're the ones making sure that everybody is getting paid. They're the ones who are making sure that um, their neighbors are okay. And so you end up with this strong connection of, of women who run these houses. Um, and so it's something to keep in mind as we're, as we're moving forward, keeping in mind this idea of women running households, but being strangely passed between households. Yeah, and it, it's interesting, too, you've sort of um, prefaced the next thing I wanted to talk about really well, and it's something you've already brought up. I mean, one, who's shocked? Uh, certainly not me, that women were providing, like, every functional piece of organization, work, and effort upon which society in the middle, early period no, was built. Women? Women are the ones doing the work? No. I would never. Yeah. Just listen to the episode on, like, the actual ecology of women. And I can't wait to do an episode on, like, the animal species that are female-led because the males are literally there to sit there and look pretty. I mean, I, uh, th th that's another episode. That's another episode. We'll get there. Um, but y you preface something I wanted to get into, which is that women's roles at this time period extended far beyond, quote, conventional, end quote, work for income as we would narrowly define it now. And and in fact, we probably like took so long to figure this out because of capitalism's narrow definition of work. Um, so this is a quote from Sharon Stratia, again, probably butchering her last name. In the 1980s and 1990s, renewed interest in women's history sparked new understandings of women's work in medicine in the early modern period. So as you mentioned, in this time period, women are engaged in medical practice, midwifery, and are community-wide renowned healers in many places. It's where the sort of trope of the wise, well, it probably emerges far before this in history, but it's one of the tropes that defines sort of the wise woman or the seer or the wise healer. And... William Minkowski, in his peer-reviewed paper, Women Healers of the Middle Ages, Selected Aspects of Their History, says that the general consensus is that compensation was not always monetary for their medical work, their midwifery, and their healing work, but that instead the return was often reciprocity, pittance, or earned community respect, and that folk medicine and general generationally past knowledge allowed for herbalism, midwifery, women as surgeons, nurses, and quote, traditional healers. And, and that this medicine at the time also traditionally relied heavily on plant compounds and botany. So this isn't like 
well, and I'm certain in some cases it was, magic as we would define it today. But women are providing a service prior to the establishment of modern medicine using a lot of the compounds we still use in medicine today. So this wasn't typically work that was paid for, but it was often work done by women that they would receive different kinds of compensation for. And about this time period that we've been living in for this episode, women's status as community healers began to change with the slow birth of the Renaissance, with the growing um, power of empiricism and the creation of academic universities and increasing misogyny in this time period. So, and this is like, again, we could do an entire podcast on this. And, and, and indeed, I've spent much of uh, my graduate school years on, on this, but qualitative or non-scientific knowledge was increasingly called into question at this time, which I will not argue that there was value for. Um, obviously, I'm like grateful for scientific and modern scientific advances that occurred in this time period. But it is unfortunate that the emergence of empirical thinking and scientific knowledge came with a heavy dose of imperialism, this idea that there is only one way of knowing anything, and it is the empirical way to know it. So long story short, again, we could we could talk for the next three hours on qualitative versus a quantitative knowledge that was emerging, but women's position as healers began to be threatened or at least looked down upon at this time. So to wrap up on our understanding of women's roles in this period of time, remember that this is also the age of Joan of Arc successfully leading the French army. And that I, I want to highlight one woman's societal position and opportunity to make clear that women had radically less rights than men in this time period and were definitely shackled by the patriarchy, but they could also like engage in some activities that will soon no longer be an option for them. So have you ever heard of Christine de Pizan? So she was a poet and author um, who turned to writing to support her herself and her family. And she's a French nas nationalist and she wrote several books, probably many books, but, but one of note is called Book of the City of Ladies. And basically the purpose of this book, written by a woman, was to critique misogynistic and slanderous views of women simply as like seducers, um, which was a lot of, a lot of writing at the time was beginning to classify women as such. I wasn't beginning to, had been for a long time. So her book is about a city where women are appreciated, a <laughs> fictional city where women are appreciated and defended. And the book presents viewpoints of women and argues that stereotypes of women that persist exist because women are removed from conversations, barred from education and positions of power. So the stereotypes can persist because women aren't given any opportunities to break them. Again, like, I mean, taken in the context of like the modern feminist movement of modern equality and equity movements, the book probably is horrendously outdated. But rather than like the three important values you shared that placed women as like quiet, pious, sex hating, baby making vessels, Pizan places women and, and argues that like there are three virtues women need and it's reason, rectitude, and justice. And through these means, women can become worthy of city of ladies. I hate that because all women are worthy of a city of ladies where they are appreciated and defended. But, but she did. It, at her time, take the, you know, the progressive stance that women's success depends on their ability to manage and mediate personal and political life by speaking and writing effectively. Now, you may also argue that women's success depends on men not belittling them, abusing them, and keeping them out of every position of power. But the point is, in this time period, women were taking power in the home and beyond. They were not handed power but they had the opportunity to claim small amounts of it. Okay, and, and so I'll end. I, I'm just going to read this whole paragraph because I really, really liked it. Because it leads us into starting to think about misogyny in this era. And also, like, when it was one of the early lines of attack against 
women during this time. But also it's, it is interesting because it shows sort of where women were in some households at this time that this could even be satire. And so I'm, I'm taking this abstract from um, Lisa Perfetti's book chapter, Taking Women's Work Seriously, Medieval Humor and the Gendering of Labor. Quote, one of the most common visual images satirizing women in the late medieval period was a woman standing atop her husband, beating him with her distaff. More than any other material object, the distaff, the primary tool of women's work with cloth, symbolized the danger entailed when women wielded power over men. Comic dramas like the popular Farce de Couvier, sorry everyone for how I said those words, demonstrated that a man who did women's work had lost his masculinity. <gasps> to restore order, he must reassert control, whether by will or brute force. The invocation to husbands to beware the horrors of being forced to do housework by domineering wives runs throughout a variety of anti-marriage treatises and narratives that present marriage as a kind of trial in which husbands are martyrs subjected to tortures, such as being <laughs> beaten by distaffs, submerged in wet laundry or soiled diapers, or stabbed by the sharp barbed tongues of their wives. My wife. Even today, a man wearing an apron and baking cookies can elicit a chuckle, depending on the context. And stereotypical jokes about nagging housewives persist. Yup. Yet laughter, as we know, can function as a zone of exploration, of unease and questioning, even when the dominant values are, are well marked and understood. Thus, the distaff-wielding woman of comic literature invites us to ask what values concerning women's work were in play during the late medieval period. So, again, these pervasive stereotypes against women are powerful and they're dominant. However, Working women in this period, like, are being observed as, and it certainly weren't domineering, but women were taking enough power for people to make comics about the power they were taking in their households from their husbands. And they weren't burned at the stake for taking that power. Instead, they were sort of, like, poked at um, in a horrendously misogynistic way in text. And that's going to change, though, real quick here. So yeah, this is all to say that misogyny sucks super hard and women's lives were limited, but they existed. They had lives outside of the home. Some women were fighting for power and speaking out against misogyny and not being killed for it. So we are rounding the corner and walking towards witch hunts. So excited to hear about the mass torture and death of women for being women. You can't. You might be able to hear it. I am rubbing my hands together because it's such an ins. Yeah, it's such an insane period of history that you just have to. And it's an insane period of history because the more you look at it, the crazier it gets. It's very much like if you look into the void, the void looks back. Is kind of how I feel when I'm studying the witch hunts. You're kind of like, ah, oh, they're coming for me now. Yeah. Well, this gay man, yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. They would have come for you. All right. So what was a witch in the 1300s and 1400s? So court records from the time show that belief in magic and witchcraft was widespread. Popular culture diverged significantly from church ideologies of the time. The Britannica website, I'll quote here, says, The variety and strange nature of popular beliefs have convinced some historians that Christianity had never really won the minds of rural people during the Middle Ages. Which is to say what we were talking about earlier, that while Christianity was widespread, pagan beliefs still predominated the minds of many people. So the witch was very real to many people in this period of time. And during the preceding medieval era, Christian doctrine had denied the existence of witches as a pagan superstition. In the 1230s, an inquisition against heresy was established by the Roman Catholic Church. And in 1258, Pope Alexander IV accepted and wrote that sorcery and, quote, communication with demons uh, was a type of heresy. But later... Uh, a man named John of Salisbury would write with skepticism about witches. So at, at the time, 
like the general consensus of the average person is that witches are real as hell. But the Catholic Church doctrine is like, no, nah, I don't like they're probably not. And and it seems that the justification from uh contemporary theologians at the time was, well, God is too powerful for witches to exist. And so at this time, magic is is broadly interpreted as the knowledge and ritual needed to manipulate nature or cause things to happen without obvious cause and effect means. And it's also important to note that like a a witch in this time was seen as so so there is a some scholars point out a difference between the word sorcerer and witch. And they hypothesize that at this time a sorcerer seems to be someone who could learn to manipulate things like via alchemy or astrology. Um, you know, you can manipulate minerals or read the stars, uh, and you could learn tools to manipulate something. Whereas when describing witches, which could manipulate the living, could see and understand the world and could heal the injured or unwell and also harm, witches had an innateness about them. There was something about witches that it was beyond just them using magic as a tool, which is we're seen as beings with some sort of like innate magic. And, and also as our friend Ollie on his excellent philosophy tube channel points out women in Europe in the late 14th century had lots of power. Some of this witchy ass power partly due to magic or the belief in magic women predominantly seen as witches, women were much more often defined as witches than men, dominated healing fields, midwifery, were most often seen as seers or wise women. And this was a, as Ollie puts it, tool of power creation for women in this time period. And again, I want to emphasize here that their magic, their power was often associated with being highly knowledgeable about the body, its processes, some of which are very mysterious to men, like ovaries and vaginas and menstruation and birth. Who understands them? Who knows about them? I don't. I know. They're secrets I don't. So you must be a witch if you know about them. Witches often were able to provide alternatives for things like contraception or abortion, as well as guiding successful births, and uh, had a lot of knowledge about botany and herbalism. So again, it, magic at this time is not always what we consider magic now it, it's more about esoteric knowledge that not everyone has access to that someone has that can allow them to manipulate situations to their will yeah and i also i want to talk about kind of this idea of magic because i would say it broadly comes in two forms secular magic and church magic mm -hmm. um, and and this is really important to life in Europe at this time, because you have books, like in the, in the English uh, context, you have a uh, book of John, of, of the book of John Mendeville, which is a travel guide for people who are going on pilgrimages to the Holy Land. And in this book, it's filled with all sorts of either miracles or supernatural events. And it's, it's kind of like what a, what a blue book of, you know, like a guidebook today. Like if you're going to visit London and you're on the air, like in the airport, they'll have those like guidebooks on like you're to visit, mm -hmm. or you visit London. And it has all like the tourist traps and stuff like that. This was that for rich people who are going on pilgrimages to gotcha. the Holy land at this time period. And a pilgrimage would take a long time. And it was filled with stuff like the, you know, the wastes of moving sands and they were just describing, um, you know, sand dunes and how they move. Yeah, yeah. But to them, that was magic, but it was also filled with more tales, um, tales of hawks granting wishes. If you see them on a full moon, you know, stuff like that. Um, and, and this was real. This was a book made by somebody who strongly believes in the in the in the church and it, and it was a mix of of like i said the secular magic and that's like the hawk granting wishes but also of this uh this church magic which is you know um I'm sure, like the miracles is, is what you would call them and i'm sure right. I'm to come it was similar to the effects of touching like a saint's bone a relic uh, as you would call it um it would absolve you of sin this is a really important distinction that we'll get into a little bit next episode but there is this wild contradiction between um the proclamations of the church that will lead to 
the trials of witches and ultimately the death of many people and the church's own practice of magic. Uh, there were, and often like men, um, who would, the, the line between, as we've said, Catholicism and paganism was, was really arbitrary at this time and sometimes non-existent. And so there are these observations, these stories of men, clergy, practicing what is easily categorized as pagan magic at the time under the veil of Catholicism. And even in some cases, like men using, again, this is for later, but I'm just uh, angry, men associated with the clergy using magic to divine who was a witch to get the witches burned. It's like <laughs> some wild backwards ass see through mm, bullshit. Mm. Um, but yeah, it's a really good, it's a good point to add to the conceptions of magic at this time. Um, I know real quick uh, too, as we're talking about like women and power in this time period. And again, many episodes will be dedicated to talking about these sorts of things, but at the same time, as we roll into the 1400s, um, indigenous resistance begins occurring at large scales because of fucking quote explorers and quote colonizers bringing um, diseases and uh, horrific uh, human wrongs to what is now referred to as South and North America. A lot of indigenous women are taking primary powerful positions in these resistances. But again, we will get into that in detail outside of this episode. So, women have power. People believe witches exist. The church, meh, is medium on the existence of witches. During the late 13th century, Thomas Aquinas, who I, again, definitely did learn about in social studies in Catholic school. I mean, I drew a picture of him in religion class when I was in that fifth grade. That sucks, dude. That sucks so I'm glad much. That's, I'm glad that's just still hanging <laughs> that around sucks my brain, so too. Much. Was he bald? I'm, was he? Did he have like the monk haircut? Like what? Yeah, he had like a, he had the classic monk haircut, and um, he had a green robe with like a yeah, red yeah. with green a robe. red and gold like embroidered border on it, um, and he had a shawl and he had a big and he had a big staff. Um, that was like kind of curly. I am so mad that I remember this. I'm so mad. No, this is wild, Reed, because I babysat a kid who had a painting of Thomas Aquinas, exactly as you just described him, hanging above his crib, which haven't revisited that memory in a while, and I hate it. I hate it so much. Yeah, um, also at this time, this is just a fun fact to make me feel better about remembering stuff about Thomas Aquinas. Some monks at this time were eunuchs, right? Um... So, and you'll oftentimes see monks in drawings have a little pouch tied around their waist. They have their balls in there. Why? They they have they carry their removed testicles in a little pouch. It's a cute no, little fashion not. accessory that they have on their waist. That's that can't be real. Okay, moving on. Um. Where were we? I got really distracted by the eunuch thing. Oh, Thomas, you were telling me something about Thomas Aquinas, and then you said something about eunuchs. You were saying that Thomas Aquinas was a bad person. Okay, so I didn't even say that. I just... So, end of the 1200s. I think we can make a fair assumption yeah. about a white dude during this time period. <laughs> I just... I don't know anything about Thomas Aquinas. Besides that, I learned about him as a fourth grader. And that his picture was hanging above the crib of a kid I babysit it. And said, I remember it 15 years later. Picture of him. And in the late 13th century, he was a very he was a theologian. He wrote a lot of stuff. And during this time period, he starts supporting the idea that um, spells, amulets, or magical rituals indicated a secret path with demons. And that sorcerers, through the support of the devil, could physically commit crimes against man and God. This is from Witches and Witch Hunts of Global History. And in 1329, so less than 100 years later, Avignon Inquisitors began to use Latin terms 
that were the synonym for witch or sorcerer still up for interpretation and um confidential interpretation. I just happened I, I just happened to know something about Thomas Aquinas. Oh and that is he this is this I man Thomas Aquinas. This he man out of your mouth. He doesn't said, deserve it. <laughs> he absolutely does, and you know it. Like, we need to drag this man. No, that's for what Phil. I meant. I meant like okay. he doesn't deserve Okay, what do you know about Thomas Aquinas? He deserves all of the hate. What is he do? He what did he do? That, right? He claimed to levitate like more than once. Shit. The joke's on you, Reed, and Thomas Aquinas' ghost is <laughs> levitating behind you, and he's gonna fuck you up. <laughs> I with never what, mess with the no, dead like that. That's what bold. is he gonna do? Throw his? Is he gonna throw his literal sack of balls at me? Oh god, I'm trembling in fear. I don't know. His big powerful man god's gonna fuck you up. He's got man god on his side. Anyway, look, bitch. I'm already a gay. I'm a gay. It's too late for me. Yeah, you're right. Man, God's already pretty pissed <laughs> off at you. Okay, so Thomas Aquinas was like, yeah, I don't know. Maybe if you, like, have a rock and use it in a ritual, you made a deal with the devil. And then in an uh, Inquisition in the mid-1300s, the Avignon Papacy Inquisitors begin to use this term that is the Latin potentially interpreted equivalent for witch or sorcerer. And so with this interpretation of the Catholic doctrine in hand, that you can be in cahoots with the devil, and um, that makes you a heretic and a witch, scholars point to traveling friars in the Swiss Alps in the 1420s that were sent to the Swiss Alps to combat and investigate heresy as one of the early forces for mobilizing, creating, spreading hysteria about witches. And their tales of witchcraft and heresy were carried back to the clergy. So there's these Catholic monks in the 1420s with this interpretation of the church that has been generated over the last hundred years of people being like, well, we thought there weren't witches, but like, yeah, there could be witches that made a deal with the devil and are doing rituals with the devil. And then that word gets subsumed into inquisitions against heresy, which are violent typically. And these monks go to the Swiss Alps and they're like, oh man, yeah, we we met a bunch of witches and they're doing bad shit. And in the 1400s, now, we witness theologians who begin publishing books examining witchcraft and describing means to identify and exterminate witches. Oh, also torture them, a lot of that. Here we get into the Malleus Maleficarum or the hammer of witches, and would form the basis for a campaign of torture, murder, and terror against witches. 80% of its victims were women for the next 250 years. And we'll spend a lot of time on sort of this, this period, the Catholic Church's involvement in these witch trials and torture and murders. And we will also dive into the grotesque, bizarre, and damaging hell of misogynistic crazy like just so much fucking anger really wild malleus maleficarum next episode i want to add here that these are not the first witch hunts in history so we see witch hunts and misogyny but but witch hunts dating back to like the greek and roman empire so this is not the first time a, a Woman has been tried as a, a witch and killed for it, but never have they occurred at the scale and with the like crazy radical increases and in hysteria that we will we will discuss. We'll return to sort of a socio political moment beyond religion. So it's at the same time as unrest and new paradigms are lurching the Catholic tor- Church towards defining and beginning a witch hunt. The impact of silver and gold coming from the new, the quote, new world, um, i.e. the violent colonization um, of indigenous peoples in the areas now nor- known as North and South America, is causing massive inflation in Europe, as you may expect. And so the cost of sustenance products are rising and wages for lower class workers are dropping. At this time, also, customary rights are beginning to be dissolved 
and in rural communities in Europe, many more people end up on the fringes than were previously. So customary rights are dissolving and private property is to be is beginning to be much more tightly defined in this socioeconomic period. And so what that leads to is a lot more people on the fringes of society. Suddenly the very impoverished, the unwell widows who had previously been at best valued members of their community and at worst sort of like begrudgingly cared for are now even less valued. And, and so these people are becoming rapidly more impoverished in this time period. And many of these individuals rejected their marginalization. So, you know, widows who had previously been healers in communities may have been angry about their social exclusion and these rapid changes that are, that are occurring socially, economically, and politically. So here I'll return to Sylvia Federici and quote from her book, Witches, Witch Hunting, and Women. In it, Federici says, the witch trials that we are about to discuss and the subsequent death, quote, occurred in societies where economic and social relations were being reshaped by the growing importance of the market and where impoverishment and rising inequalities were rampant. Later, Federici states, quote, in the which the authorities simultaneously punish the attack on private property, social insubordination, the propagation of magical beliefs, which presume the presence of powers they could not control. So this is where we're leaving things today. It's a time of immense unrest and a huge recent trauma, at least intergenerational trauma at minimum, in which the Catholic Church is, is undergoing upheavals and changing doctrine surrounding witches. And socially and economically, things are changing really quickly. Communities are becoming restructured. Impoverishment is on the rise. There's growing unrest from peasantry and the lower class. And we have like one or several witch trials occurring, but no large scale aggressive persecution. And I think that's where we're going to leave it for now. So read any sign off, anything you want to plug. Yeah. It feels weird to uh, plug your stuff after talking about <laughs> such heavy material, but I guess I'll just, yeah, dude, like shit's horrible. The world's dumb now. Like, um, yay. Capitalism. Like, yay, come on capitalism. yourself. Yay. I guess I'll just give my, um, my Twitch, which is Equinox spirit. Um, one word, Equinox Spirit, because um, I'm a witch bitch. Uh, and yeah, and my Instagram and my TikTok, which are at Reed Eckert. I don't post on Instagram super often. I post art and photo shoots um, every once in a while. But on my TikTok, I give old English lessons and skate. So if those are things you're interested in, give me a follow. Check me out. And as always, you can find us at The Witch Podcast on Twitter and Instagram, at The Witch Pod on Facebook, and we are also on Patreon. A huge shout out and thanks to Lexi and Kimberly, who are new patrons of The Witch Podcast. Thanks to all of you for your ongoing support and your kind words. Thank you for everyone who has left us a review on iTunes. And if you haven't yet, please subscribe, rate, and review on iTunes or another podcast platform. Thank you for putting up with this uh, recorded in a canvas wall tent audio quality. Thank you for all you do. Look out for each other, cherish yourself, and find a way to hex the patriarchy today. Until next time.